Uh, I invite Dr. Tushar Maniar, Head of Department of Pediatrics, Nanoti Hospital, and a, a dear friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sure. Tushar. What I wanted to remind you all is that you have braved the rains and the Sunday morning, and you have arrived here only to hear a painful session. Okay. <laughs> If you have not noticed, it's painful as in with double L. We started with chest pain. Now we are going to have limb pains. Soon we'll be talking about urinary pain. Not to forget abdominal pain, and last but not the least, the headache. So we have a lot of pain involved. But as Dr. Snehal always says, there is no gain without pain. Uh, whenever a child walks in to your clinic or is brought by the mother saying that my child is limping, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Okay? Injury, trauma. That's the first thought that comes to all of us. Anything else? Fever. Fever. Excellent. Anything worries more, more serious or worrisome? Age-wise consideration. Excellent. So in pediatrics, we call it a dynamic field and nothing is fixed, neither the dosages, nor the weight, nor the diseases. So depending on where you are, in which age group, your causes will differ. What I do is I ask myself three questions whenever a child walks in with limp. The first question which all of us must ask is whether this is a painful limp or a painless limp. I know we are going to focus today on painful limb, but it's important to know that when a child comes with a limp and is not in pain, I would be more worried, generally speaking, as compared to somebody who walks in with a painful limb. Because a painless limp almost always signifies a neuromuscular disorder, sorry, a neurological disorder, versus a painful limp which is a common condition occurring with any musculoskeletal disorders. The next question that I want to ask myself is whether this child is a well child or a sick child. The third question that I ask, I ask is whether the pain is localized or is this a diffuse pain. What do you mean by a sick child? Fever, excellent. So first thing, most common condition with sick child is fever. Lethargic, not eating well, crying excessively, not sleeping well, losing weight, and not growing properly, depending upon how long the disease has been. Depending on whether it's a local or diffuse and well or sick, with these combinations, a permutation and combination, you can arrive at a reasonable conclusion just in the history itself. So this is how we would approach a child who walks in with a limp. The next slide. When you are looking at a musculoskeletal uh, problem with a painful limp in a well child, diffuse pains are not so common. And we will not be spending too much time on that. We'll be focusing on localized pain. And as you all rightly said, the commonest cause is trauma. So, the ankle sprain in children is the most common condition that you, acquire, that you come across while dealing with traumatic localized pain in a well child. On the other hand, you may not have history of pain at all, and there will be a child who is apparently well and with localized pain. So if you are looking at heel, localized pain, you are localizing to heel, I would be thinking in terms of calcaneal epiphysitis. An adolescent who comes with a sudden onset knee swelling, or sorry, uh, knee pain, after performing some kind of aggressive activity, I would be thinking in terms of condition called Osgood-Schlatter. Or a child who comes with isolated hip pain, apart from thinking about arthritis and other systemic causes, one would be thinking in terms of Perthes disease. But as a historian, you want to make sure when you don't get history of trauma that there is actually no history of trauma. In children, many times you don't get to know all the details firsthand, so you need to dig in further. 
You have a child or toddler who has recently learned to jump, has gone out, played together, been jumping on and off whole day long, comes next day with a limp, is most likely to have transient synovitis of the hip joint, which my dear friend Dr. Mamtora says the correct terminology would be overuse synovitis of the hip joint. And you can have many situations with overuse. You can have many of us start to lose, attempting to lose weight, start running rather than walking, and come with shin splits. We have athletes who come without preparation when they prepare, then they come with tarsal pain and tenderness. On the other hand, you can have serious disorders where there may be a bleeding in the joint and they will come with acute limp and swelling with apparently no trauma, the commonest condition being hemophilia. Next, please. On the other hand, if I have a child with painful limb who is sick, and we already discussed what a sick child means, if he has localized pain, I would be looking for septic arthritis. According to us pediatricians, septic arthritis is an orthopedic emergency. We don't talk about come tomorrow or day after and we'll do this. We want to find an orthopedic surgeon who not only will be available, but would be ready to put in a needle or put the patient and treat immediately. If you get point tenderness or localized pains, think about osteomyelitis in a child who is running high fever. On the other hand, if you have diffuse pain in a sick child, think about autoimmune conditions like SLE or juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Also, you can have malignancies, commonest being acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Just as you all know Dr. V. R. Joshi as a master in rheumatology, in adult rheumatology, Dr. Raju Kupchandani from Just Lok is a pediatric rheumatologist, and whatever little that I have learned, and most of the things that I am talking, I have learned from him. And if you talk to him for even some time, he will tell you, that apart from juvenile, apart from rheumatic conditions, if there is any other condition that he diagnoses, is leukemia. This is how close the differential goes, and he gets most of the referrals. So you can imagine that patient having gone either to the general practitioners or to us pediatricians, maybe one or two or three, and land up with him only to be diagnosed as possibly leukemia and sent to the hematologist. Next, please. <clears throat> Once we have localized that this is not a bone, not skin soft tissue, not a tendon, and we are not dealing with muscle problem, we look at arthritis. Arthritis, though not so common in pediatrics, we all would like to know because early diagnosis and treatment will make a big difference. So as in anything else, the most important thing is to rule out what is most urgent or critical to manage. And as I already said, septic arthritis is the most important thing to manage. When taking the history further, I would prefer to follow a standard protocol of ODP as we have been taught right in our undergraduate times. Onset duration and progress followed by, say for example, five common conditions appropriate to the ODP would give you a diagnosis in most cases. So let's go through that exercise here. If there is arthritis which has happened in a matter of hours, what would you be thinking of? Traumatic. traumatic, excellent. So as we said, trauma automatically we will add hemophilia because it is still in a way traumatic. Or bacterial arthritis or bacterial septic arthritis, which may not be exactly hours, maybe hours to a day. And when you talk about days, as in few days to a week, what are you thinking of? Crystal induce, okay. Fortunately, in pediatrics, we don't have so many crystal induce. Okay, so tuberculosis, very good. So certain other infections like tuberculosis, rheumatic fever, very good. Or all your forms of juvenile arthritis, reactive arthritis, all these would come within days to weeks. It's good to remember that if a joint does not migrate in a week, it is not acute rheumatic fever. Okay, these are generalizations. 
but they're very useful. On the other hand, if you have diseases which are going on for, arthritis which is going on for weeks, then you are thinking in terms of, if it is early weeks, like one week, two weeks, you will still consider malignancy, but say five weeks, six weeks, and no other symptoms coming in, then you will think in terms of juvenile idiopathic arthritis or SLE or some other such things. We want to see what, how the joints have, how the arthritis has progressed. So, whether there has been one, arthritis, one joint involvement with another joint getting involved and then the third joint getting involved, this is what you see normally in rheumatic arthritis, that is juvenile idiopathic arthritis. That's why we wait for six months before we say for sure whether this is oligoarticular or will become polyarticular, okay? On the other hand, as I said, migratory. Migratory means we, one joint is become completely or almost become all right and another joint gets involved. This is the pattern that we see in rheumatic fever. Being a pediatrician, we want to diagnose rheumatic fevers quickly. And that is the close differential. We always struggle to make a difference between reactive arthritis and rheumatic fever. So if the child has large joint involvement, if the joint is extremely tender, so much so that they say, even if you move my bed sheet, it hurts. If you get a history of this kind, then you're thinking in terms of rheumatic. Also, when you start treatment with, say, aspirin, it responds magically, almost in 24 to 48 hours. All these will help you in differentiating reactive arthritis from rheumatic arthritis. It's good to know whether one joint is involved, few joints are involved, or many joints are involved because the differential diagnosis, investigation, and management will be very different. It's also good to know whether this is involvement is axial skeleton, as you would see in adults with ankylosing spondylitis, or in pediatrics, more with juvenile ankylosing spondylitis. Also, it is important to know distribution, whether it is symmetrical or asymmetrical, and if the patient has come in late, then you want to know whether it is deforming or non-deforming. So it's good to know that acute rheumatic fever, it only bites the joint, but it eats the valves. So it damages the valves, or oh, sorry, it licks the joint and bites the valves. Sorry, I was just thinking something is missing here. It's important to know, of course, that associated symptoms will not only guide you to the cause of the joint, but also make you decide whether you have to act urgently or not. So most important thing, next please. You want to know whenever a patient comes, whether you are dealing with a serious problem or a benign problem. When a patient walks into the OPD, my first question to myself is, does this child require ICU? You will find it funny, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about any child or any patient that you first see. Most of the time, fortunately, the answer is no. The second question that I ask myself is, does he require admission? Third question is, does he require urgent treatment? Fourth will be, does he require investigation? Or fourth, does he require only monitoring and reassurance? So if you follow this, then you know for sure that you will not miss out anything urgent. So if the arthritis is worse at rest, but becomes better with, with activity, it's present more in the morning or wakes up the child at night, I would be worried. And obviously, if there are bone pains, weakness, associated symptoms, I would be concerned. Growth affection is almost always considered a problem in pediatrics, and we pay serious attention to it. So this is a three-year-old child. I gave this uh, case scenario to you by saying that this is a toddler with overuse synovitis of the hip joint. Next one, please. This is a five-year-old child has been has developed swelling and pain in left ankle since last three days. He had fever eight days back, lasting for two, year, two days, along with loose motions for three days. Reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis, excellent. So when you have an insult, a period of calm, and then an arthritis, you would think in terms of reactive arthritis. Again, I would have asked myself three questions. Pain, yes. Well child, yes. Localized, yes. Trauma, no. So then I narrow down to no trauma and the causes of that. Next, please. A seven-year-old boy is brought with a limp. He has fever since last eight days. He has been complaining of pain all over and has poor appetite. 
Mother says he is irritable and gets up with pain in both his legs at night. Serious leukemia. Both are absolutely correct. So again, painful, sick child, diffuse pain. Right? So this is our red flag. Can we go to the next one? So we now will look at the red flags. That means the danger signs when a child comes with arthritis. Any joint which is red is septic till proved otherwise in pediatrics. Because I know Dr. Mamtra is sitting here, he'll say, no, no, crystal induced in adults is more common and they can have red joints. And I totally agree with him. But when we are talking about pediatrics, this is something that I would like you to remember. If a child comes with night pains, if he doesn't re uh, respond to medication, if he has point tenderness over bones, or any child who is sick with a single joint involvement, I would be worried. So friends, to conclude, next slide please. I just want you to remember, whenever a child walks in with a limb, make sure whether he has painful limb or a painless limb. Find out whether he is well or sick. And do worry if he has a red joint, if he has night pain, or it's associated with fever. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing.